Sit down, my king. I said to the young Frédéric Roger as he entered the garden. It is time for your studies. Your German tutors have no doubt told you of the deeds of your Teutonic grandfather. I knew that story by heart, the boy king replied proudly. Indeed, I said with a wink. But I will tell you of the other side of your family. For you are firstly a son of Sicily. Ah, dear Sicily, a kingdom like no other, where three peoples were fused under the southern sun and formed the jewel that lies between east and west. It was the Norman side of your family that made it all possible. Normandy was a cold northern land of steel and chivalry. But it was also overflowing with the younger sons of minor barons. Men aspiring to a greatness that exceeded the constraints of birth and station. This story, your story, begins with your great-grandfather's brother, Robert de Hauteville. A man of immense stature, with fair hair, broad shoulders, and eyes that all but shot out sparks of flame. Robert was driven and possessed that incorrigible confidence that melts away doubts and allows ambition to keep pace with imagination. More cunning than any foe he faced, he was ever vigilant to seize any advantage, win through any means, and remain unbound by the rules of lesser men. You speak of him as a great man, but what did he do? The boy king asked, his eyes now wide with childish enthusiasm. I answered. Robert was the first to unite all Italian Normans under a single ruler. But his origins were very humble. He came from Normandy to Italy with scarcely 30 followers and sought fortune in this land that so often rewards those with the daring and brilliance to seize it. You are not in Normandy, Robert. I make the rules here. Leave Italy before I have you and your band of robbers hung from my tower. I did not come all the way from Normandy for this. If you will not give me the lands I deserve, I will take them myself. The Italian peasants make poor fighters. Get on your horses, men. We will conquer other Norman baronies to grow our warband. Salerno's power is broken, but the Lombards remain rebellious. I will take their Princess Sikilgaita as my wife, so that the people bend to my will. Normans, remember why we came to Italy. We will be ruthless, we will conquer, we will take and kill, and make a name for ourselves in this land like our fathers' fathers did in Normandy. Join me, and I will lead us to greatness. The Italians called Robert Giscard, the cunning fox. In a few decades, he had brought all of southern Italy to heel. But his imagination and his cunning would carry him across the horizon to new conquests. Where did he go next? The boy king nearly jumped up as he asked. That is a story for tomorrow. Not even a king can learn all of history in a single day. I remained in the garden as young Frédéric Roger hurried off, a smile resting on my face. Already, I could see in him the shadow of his forefathers. Perhaps one day, this boy would eclipse them all. Stories of Robert's successes in Italy inspired the Normandy broken by civil war. The Norman Duke, William, had not yet earned the title, the Conqueror. 
and was still a controversial young bastard, barely clinging to power. Many Norman knights, bloodied by civil war and lured by southern riches, set out for Italy. Robert's youngest brother, your great-grandfather, Roger Diotville, was among them, but he was different. Where Robert was ruthless and cunning, Roger was patient and chivalrous. He was motivated by love. Judith Devro, cousin of Duke William, had stolen Roger's heart, and the two wished to be married. Judith's father, however, would never entertain the thought of his daughter marrying a mere landless knight. Roger had no choice but to go to Italy to prove himself worthy of the woman that he loved. But Robert Giscard, like his brother before him, expected Roger to make his own way in Italy, as he had done years before. He offered Roger no lands and no knights. Fortunately for Roger, there was still a prize awaiting a man of his talents. An island ruled by Muslims for two centuries, but now divided between rival emirs, Sicily beckoned. The people of this island, Christian and Muslim, suffered for too long under feuding emirs. God willing, I will build a new order here, where Norman, Greek and Arab live together in peace. Sicily was a land fitting for a man like Roger. Daring and ambitious, but also patient, chivalric, tolerant, and above all, motivated by love. He married his beloved Judith and settled in a Sicilian court. Roger Bosso, the Great Count, as your great-grandfather would come to be known, was more than a conqueror. Adopting the ways of the island, he fashioned a new eclecticism that gave Sicily its unique character and strength. I do not know these words, the boy king said sadly. Forgive me, my king. What it means is that the warm Mediterranean breezes, the cool marble colonnades, the bubbly fountains splashing among the lemon trees, these are marked on your soul. You are shaped by this land, where Catholic church bells and the Orthodox liturgy mingle seamlessly with the Islamic call to prayer. It is a heritage unlike any other, all thanks to your great-grandfather. The boy nodded. I did not think he could yet fathom just how unique his kingdom was. What did my great-grandfather do next? Asked the boy king. I know that you want to hear more of Count Roger, my young king. But there are many lessons to learn from the other Otvies. While your great-grandfather was uniting Sicily, Robert Giscard looked east to a Byzantine empire reeling from its crushing defeat at Manzikert. He arranged for an Orthodox monk to claim that he was a deposed emperor in need of Giscard's support. Giscard recognized, however, that he could not devote his full attention to such a campaign. The ceaseless feuds between Pope and Holy Roman Emperor would inevitably draw him back to Italy. He therefore assigned the command of the expedition to his eldest son, Bohemond. Twenty years before, when Bohemond had been a boy, Giscard discarded Bohemond's mother 
to marry a local Lombard princess for a momentary advantage. The first marriage to Boyomon's mother was ruled invalid by a compliant pope, reducing Boyomon to a bastard. By tradition, nothing of Giscard's would pass to Boyomon. But this obstacle only hardened the warrior prince. He had all the individual heroism, tactical brilliance, and the religious conviction to inspire men to follow him to the ends of the earth and challenge even an emperor. What Boyamond had not accounted for, however, was the power of a woman. I am not finished yet, Norman. We will meet again. You may have defeated the Greeks, Boyamond, but believe me, I am not finished with you. My son will soon take the throne, and you will never set foot in Italy again. Robert Giscard died suddenly in 1085, while Boyomond was stricken by illness, or as some say, poisoned by his stepmother, Sikel Gaita. Believing that Boyomond might die, the Norman lords had no choice but to elect Sikel Gaita's son as duke, a decision further encouraged by Count Roger of Sicily's support for the weaker and more easily influenced second son of Robert Guiscard. The seeds of Count Roger's patience were beginning to take root, but Boyamon's story is not yet finished. Boyamon never forgave Count Roger for siding with his younger brother, but other events would draw Boyamond away before he could threaten Norman unity. As bands of knights and foot soldiers passed through Sicily on their way to the Holy Land, Roger arranged for Boyamond to linger amongst them. Lured by the promises of lands and eternal glory on crusade, Boyamond too set out for the east. Boyamond retraced the path through the Byzantine Empire that he had taken only a few years before, while warring against the Emperor Alexios Komnenos. Now, however, he came to Constantinople as an honored guest, kneeling before his old adversary and promising to restore the Empire's territories in the Holy Land. Boyamond, of course, shared his father's cunning and had no intention of following through with such a promise. When the Crusaders besieged the ancient city of Antioch, Boyamond resolved that it should be his. Mustering the cunning of his heritage, Boyamond told the Emperor's men that the other Crusaders planned to assassinate them, causing them to return home. He then bribed a local garrison commander to open Antioch's gates, but only after he had secured the sworn promises of the other Crusader princes that the first among them to enter the city would rule it. Unfortunately for Boyomond and the Crusaders, a great Turkish army was on its way. Already worn down by eight long months of siege, Boyomond would need every ounce of his courage and his skill to survive. Jerusalem. 
While Boyamon did not inherit his father's lands, he did inherit his attributes, and these won him a princedom. But Boyamond was not done after conquering Antioch. He sought every opportunity to conquer new lands, but his fearless aggression led him to being ambushed and captured by the Turks. His old enemy, the Emperor Alexios Komnenos, even offered to pay Boyamon's ransom if the Norman prince was brought to Constantinople in chains. Once again, Boyamon bested his old enemy, tricking his Turkish captors into releasing him for a smaller ransom. Years later, Boyamond again fought against the Emperor, but was surrounded by the Emperor's armies. He agreed to become a vassal of Emperor Alexios, but Boyamond's cunning had one last triumph. So that the treaty binding Boyamond to the Emperor would not include Antioch, Boyamond never again set foot in the city. He died in Sicily leaving his son to succeed him in his hard-won Eastern princedom. Our story is coming nearly to an end, my young king. But I have not yet even told you of your grandfather, he who first wore the crown that now rests upon your head. It is a story that should sound familiar to you. Your grandfather's father, the great Count Roger, died when Roger II was only a boy. Like you, he was raised by his mother in a cosmopolitan court among Greek and Muslim tutors. While such an upbringing meant that the young Roger lacked the martial confidence of his forebears, he instead gained skills for diplomacy and statecraft that would prove far more valuable. At that time, Norman Italy was divided into two lordships. Apulia, ruled by Robert Giscard's grandson, and Sicily, ruled by Roger. When his cousin in Apulia died, childless, in 1127, Roger claimed all Haute lands in Italy, forming the United Kingdom of Sicily. But this growing power and Roger's tolerance for peoples of all faiths raised the suspicions of the Pope. Railing against the half-heathen prince, the Pope called the Crusade. Roger's Norman vassals, led by his own brother-in-law, rose in rebellion, while a mighty German army, headed by the Holy Roman Emperor himself, marched down the length of Italy. But Roger had grander ambitions than fighting Normans and German princes. He had a kingdom to build. Poets, scientists and artists came to Sicily from both the Islamic and Christian worlds welcomed with admiration and tolerance. The long gestating seeds of Count Roger's patience planted in this most fertile soil had finally awoken and flowered under King Roger and this bright kingdom in the sun. As for the Holy Roman Emperor, he died in the mountains on his way back to Germany. His throne stood empty for many years, Though his grandson, styling himself Henry the Lion, would lay claim to it. Ultimately, it was your German grandfather who finally restored the Holy Roman Empire and united Germany and Italy. You see, my dear Frederic Roger, in your name, you carry the legacies of both of your grandfathers. One whom your German tutors adore was, of course, the great Frederic Barbarossa. But the other, half Norman, half Italian, but fully Sicilian, was most like you. And that, my young king, is the story 
of how your family built the kingdom that you now rule. The young king watched me for a moment. He stood up, thanked me for the lecture, and walked away. About halfway through the garden, he stopped and stood silent for a while, and then asked thoughtfully, Do you think that I will be their equal? A new Giscard? Or Roger Boso? Or King Roger? My king, I said, in time, you will outshine them all.